Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you uh, everyone who made PyCon Israel happen. It's really nice to be here. Um, my talk, my title is actually much longer. I talk about all these packages. That was actually the title for my tutorial. I think I messed it up. This is the actual title, but it's the same thing pretty much. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about why you should do text analysis in Python, even if you don't want to. Uh, that's my name. It's kind of big, but yeah. So let's start. Why text analysis? Uh, so I'm going to, my, the first part is going to be about text analysis and the second part about Python. And I'm going to start by trying to convince all of you that text analysis is super fun, super cool, and also something that everyone can actually do. Now, one of the reasons I personally enjoy text analysis is because of how I can relate to the numbers or I can relate to the content which I'm producing. I see that in most kind of data analysis, machine learning, there's usually a lot of numbers and it's not always personal. I like the data I work with to be personal. So I'm going to give a few examples of uh, how you can use text analysis to figure out really cool stuff. I'm going to start with uh, not so fun, I mean, it's kind of fun, but it's about politics, which is not always fun, and in particular it's about Donald Trump. But the interesting thing over here is because of the fact that he tweets a lot. Now, this is very interesting because the fact that he tweets means we suddenly now have a lot of textual data. Now, what exactly are we going to try and figure out about Donald Trump? In 2015, I believe, when he started trying to get politically involved, I mean, he did it before, but like when he was really getting into it, he would tweet a lot. And he, people noticed that there were two different accounts which he was tweeting from. There was an Android account and there was an iPhone account. And what people also started noticing was the kind of tweets which he would tweet from his Android account and his iPhone account were kind of different. Now, the interesting part, all of the tweets which his iPhone account would tweet on were really nice, you know, I mean, well, as nice as it can get, I suppose, but things like if he would have a massive rally in Pittsburgh, they would be like, thanks for coming out and supporting uh, me in the rally in Pittsburgh and so on and so forth. And these are all iPhone tweets. And then all of his Android tweets were kind of angrier, you know, like sad, angry, and you know, he would keep using those caps and he would retweet and it was really Trump. You could, you could see the tweets were noticeably different. And an easy guess, an easy way to figure out who it was, whether it was his PR team or actually Trump doing the tweets himself, you could figure out with the whole Android and iPhone thing. So for a long time, people thought, okay, we kind of know when who's doing the tweeting. There were also times of the day you could, you could check which times of the day were there were Android messages, which time were iPhone, and you could figure out there's a kind of pattern. But what happened in November 2016 when he was elected into office was that they took away his Android phone and the, his PR team gave him another iPhone. Now this is a problem, right, for us who want to know when it's actually Trump or not. So we didn't know whether it was actually Trump doing the tweeting or whether it was his PR team doing it because now both of these tweets are coming from his iPhone. And his iPhone actually has like an iPhone specifically made for tweeting. It's like, it's really interesting. And what people started to do was they started to wonder, can we build a machine learning classifier to predict if the tweet is a Trump tweet or if it's a PR team tweet? And how do you do this? We already have historical data for a couple of years of his uh, Android tweets and his iPhone tweets. So you try to decide that, okay, if it's an Android tweet, it's Trump. If it's an iPhone tweet, it's a PR team. And train a model to figure out, can we understand the way Trump tweets? Later, they started classifying the new tweets into, you know, PR team or Trump, and you could again see the difference. It was noticeable. All of the nicer, more, you know, thank you for coming out, thank you for the support, or the more diplomatic PR stuff were noticeably being classified as the PR team, and all the angrier, sad, fake news stuff was like the Trump stuff. So it was really interesting how you could build a machine learning model just analyzing text to see if it was him or not. And this is and personally, because of the fact that Twitter, I mean, people are tweeting all the time, there's text data being generated constantly. This means that we have an important source of data. So this is one example I like to give, and I tell people, like, you should do text analysis, it's fun. Now, the second thing is a little more personal. Um, I don't know, like, particularly in Israel, what kind of messaging app is popular, but uh, I live in France, and in France it's usually Facebook Messenger, and like when I was living in India, it was WhatsApp. So what I did, you, you figure out that if you scroll through your WhatsApp contacts and if you hold down your chat, you can actually have an option to email your entire chat history to yourself. I was in a WhatsApp group with four of my friends for like seven years. So I thought it'd be interesting to try and see what kind of things am I talking about with my friends. So I actually emailed myself seven years worth of chat history with me and three of my best mates. And I started doing some basic analysis. 
so all of us are big football fans. So I noticed in the summers of 2000 and well, 2010, 40, yeah, 2010 and 2014, we'd start talking about football more. So when I, I did topic modeling, which is a statistical method to find out what topics am I talking about in text. So I'd noticed in summer there was a peak. I'm suddenly talking about football. There was one summer when all of us happened to all break up with our girlfriends. So we're like all talking about, you know, me sad music and all this relationship stuff. So you could see these patterns. You could see the way, the way we typed evolved over seven years. Seven years is a long time. 2010, you were much younger. I mean, I was much younger, so we all were. But so the kind of way which we used to type, all of these things evolved over time. And it was interesting for me to see my conversations with my friends, the way they evolved over time. And when we started moving abroad for studies or for working, there were different times of the day because of the time difference in which we were more active. I try to figure out who's starting the most conversations, who's responding the most, all very interesting personal things. And you could do all of this extremely easily with Python, simple text scraping. Now, another useful thing, which I think text analysis makes me really excited about is research. I'm a researcher and I really like the English language and English literature, and in particular Shakespeare. Now, for a long time, researchers, especially literature researchers, were trying to figure out was Shakespeare the only one writing all of his plays? Because it was not sure, I mean, he was extremely prolific. He wrote a lot of work. And they did notice that in some of his works, the style was kind of different. Now, it's uh, literature uh, researchers spend a long time trying to understand how can we decide if a work of art is to be attributed to Shakespeare or someone else. So they decided to do something along with computer scientists and data scientists called uh, style analysis. Now, style analysis is a way when, I mean, as it suggests, you try to figure out the kind of way a person writes. You do this in various ways. You can find out the way they use their articles or adjectives, the spacing, and how often are they typing in a certain way. Now, once you have your style analysis, you can try and figure out, you can use a clustering kind of algorithm to cluster the works of art. So what they did right now, there's another English playwright whose name is Christopher Monroe. And they tried to do a style analysis of him, of Shakespeare, and of a bunch of other playwrights in the 16th, 16th century, I believe. And they noticed that certain works of art, I do believe this is the Henry VIII, I think it was, uh, this, these were the works of art, which uh, the, the plays, which were not very really sure if it was Shakespeare or not. And they found out using style analysis that it largely overlapped with Christopher's work. And later, with, with the help of actual literary researchers, they could actually, they changed the attribution that it was co-written by both Shakespeare and Christopher. And this is extremely interesting. This is a way you use text analysis to solve a problem which literature researchers, English literature researchers have been trying to work or fight with for a long time. And this is just, these are three examples which I like to talk about are just really interesting personal problems which you can try and figure out more using text analysis. So this is, now text analysis itself is broken up into many, many different parts, but these are just three examples which I really like to talk about. Now, I've talked about, so you have a, an idea of the kind of cool things you can do with text analysis, but why Python? Which is my next slide. Um, Python, of course, I mean, we're all here. I mean, it is PyCon, so I mean, we all like programming in Python, I hope. But the particular thing which I really, really enjoy for text analysis in Python is, well, Python is a scraping language, right? Like after Perl, it's one of the easiest languages to actually write small scripts to start reading text files. It means just the way the language was initially <coughs> text manipulation, text scraping, it's all very easy in Python. It's intuitive, it reads like English. I mean, these are all reasons why we use Python in the first place, right? But for text analysis, it's particularly intuitive. But apart from the general reasons of why Python as a programming language is good because the scripting language and so on and so forth, it's also the ecosystem. When it comes to natural language processing in particular, there are a few other languages, programming languages, which are have the kind of uh, libraries which Python has. Uh, for example, Spacey is one of my new favorites where you have industrial strength processing capacities in Python. You, have, you can do extremely cool things with their pipelines. Gensim is another really popular package you can actually use in production. Everyone, most people here know about scikit-learn as well, another Python package, which you can actually, like Apple, for example, uses scikit-learn. You can use these Python packages in production, which makes it really, really special. NLTK, while not being one of my favorite uh, Python natural language libraries, also happens to be, from a research point of view, 
it's really, really useful. This kind of ecosystem is not really there in any other language. I mean, of course, you can argue that with Java and there's, there are ways to do it, but when it comes to quick scripting, incredible ecosystem, wonderful community as well, and like, for example, in particular, Spacey's community is really striving to have language models for all kind of languages. They're not focusing just on English. There's even a Hebrew tokenizer, for example. So the community coupled with the incredible libraries allowing you to actually make production level code at home for small projects is just incredible. So the reason why you should use Python is probably the reason why you should use Python for any kind of data analysis, but particularly for text analysis, it really is absolutely incredible. I cannot recommend uh, checking out the ecosystem. And the title of my talk actually talks about, you can see the other libraries which are commonly used for text analysis. Now, where's the data for, uh, also one thing, if you guys want to stop me, uh, if you folks want to stop me anytime in between, just raise your hand and I do not mind stopping during the, my talk. Uh, so where's the data? I already talked about uh, the kind of places where you can find data, right? I talked about using WhatsApp, about using Facebook Messenger, about literature, you can download books and parse them and so on and so forth. And Twitter, there are, for example, Tweepy or Tweepy, I'm not sure how they want us to pronounce it, but is a, a Twitter API which allows you to actually extremely easily, like a few lines of code, d uh, like scrape a lot of tweets off the internet. Then you have Beautiful Soup, which is a library for uh, getting uh, HTML data. So you can actually use the internet as your data source. One of my personal data sources is Reddit because I spend way too much time on Reddit. I should really stop doing that. But Reddit is an incredible data source because there's a lot of rich text. It's also very structured. You get the data on JSON files, you have replies, so you can actually, you can model the way people reply to each other. This is good if you want to try and model human behavior, the way people talk. If you want to find out semantics, Reddit also has many subreddits, which means you can focus in on a particular subject area which you might be personally interested in. So the internet and the fact that everyone is posting all the time makes it really, really easy. Now, the internet is also unstructured data, right? You also have a lot of structured data sets out there. A lot, for example, sentiment analysis is an extremely popular text analysis uh, task where you try to find the sentiment of a document as happy, sad, angry, and so on and so forth by uh, reading the text. I mean, have parsing the test and building a machine learning classifier. When you're making a classifier, you need to have pre-labeled classes of what is happy and what is sad and so on. And you actually have these. There's a lot of rich data sets out there which you can use. So you have unstructured data which you can scrape off the internet. You have structured data sets which you can download. Kaggle has a lot of interesting data sets as well. There's an incredible amount of data. There's also personal data, your own emails like I talked about before, WhatsApp and Facebook and so on and so forth. Really, there's no shortage of data. And the best part about it is, like I talked about earlier, it's really, it can, has the potential to be really personal. It has the potential to be interesting to you. So even if you're not a data scientist, even if your company does not want you to do this kind of work, Personally, it's really, really easy for you to get data. Pre-processing. Uh, the reason, I mean, of course, in any kind of machine learning task, pre-processing is extremely important. Garbage in, garbage out. If you're going to be feeding in rubbish data into a machine learning process or any kind of intelligent process, you're going to have garbage results. In text analysis, this becomes even more important. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a certain kind of uh, text analysis uh, technique called topic modeling, which I talked about before briefly. Uh, topic modeling, uh, what it does is well, it creates, it finds topics in text. Uh, for example, if you happen to be working for a newspaper agency and you have a lot of, uh, well, newspaper, you have an entire historical archival collection of newspaper articles from the year 2000 till now or whatever, and you want to find out what kind of topics are being talked about. You want to cluster these, but you have no idea what's in there, completely unstructured data. You can use topic modeling algorithms to find out hidden topics in your text. For example, since I'm talking about newspaper articles, you'd have sports, the weather, politics, so on and so forth. So you can find out these topics in text. Now, the way these topics are structured is they look for keywords. Why does pre-processing become very important here? If you have, in, this is of course in English uh, and it extends to every other language as well, I just do not know any Hebrew examples, but um, for example, in English, words like a, and the, which are articles, or other words like he, him, which are again, uh, so these words are called stop words in English, or in, in, in stop words in any language, but in, in the realm of natural language processing, stop words are words which do not add any real 
information to your topic model. Imagine you ran a topic modeling algorithm on your newspaper data and you had your sports topic and your weather topic and you also had like an article topic which is A and the and him and her. That's not useful information, right? So before you actually process your newspaper articles, you might want to get rid of your stop words. This is one example of pre-processing. There are many ways you pre-process your data, but in text analysis, this becomes extremely, extremely vital. It's 90% of text analysis is pre-processing. So that's why I have a whole slide just pre-processing. And in particular, Spacey has an extremely uh, well-made pre-processing pipeline, which I'll talk about in a small bit. Machine learning in text. I've already given you a lot of examples of machine learning in text. Uh, for example, I talked about topic modeling, which is considered a statistical uh, learning process. So it's again machine learning. Uh, another really popular example, which everyone personally deals with, would be spam and not spam, right? When we get email. This is also machine learning because we're classifying our text as spam or not spam. So what we do is we learn what kind of uh, documents or emails might be spam, and then we mark them, and then we can build a classifier to tell spam or not spam. Certain kind of mails are more likely to be spam if you have certain words which give away, like for example, winner, enlargement, and so on and so forth. You have, so you know somewhere just some emails are going to be spam and not spam. Building these kind of systems is an example of how we're using machine learning in text. Even the same example with deciding if it's the PR team or not the PR team with Trump, that's also machine learning in text. So it becomes really easy to do machine learning in text. There's a lot of Python packages which are built not just for machine learning, but machine learning especially for text. Gensim is one such package. Scikit-learn also has a pretty neat text pre-processing pipeline and everything set up just for you to do machine learning in for text analysis. Word embeddings. This is one of my uh, favorite parts of text analysis. Um, I really like talking about this particular example. Uh, word embeddings are usually very, very popular. Uh, re especially for the last couple of years because they allow you to understand words in different, pos in different ways, words ways in which you've not done before. Uh, for example, in 2013 or 15, I'm not sure which one, Google, uh, the Google uh, Natural Language Processing Team released a paper talking about a new method called Word2Vec. Uh, Word2Vec stands for Word2Vector. Uh, what this means is normally when we're, in, when we're dealing in machine learning, since of course Machines do not understand words, right? You would need to input numbers for them to have any, to make any sense of it and produce useful results. So um, what they did was trying to say, can we semantically understand words and give a vector representation? Again, here, a vector representation is a representation in vector space. For those who might not know what this means, it basically means a way we can represent words as numbers in a more intelligent way. This would also mean you could do things like you can add and subtract vectors. Now this means we have the potential to add and subtract words. Uh, a popular example which is there in the Google paper is the word they did, they did this particular example. They did the word vector of king minus the word vector of man plus the word vector of woman. And they tried to see what word vector is the closest. And it, after they ran the whole algorithm, it turned out to be the word vector for queen which is absolutely remarkable. King minus man plus woman is queens, kind of, in the sense of you have the idea of king and royalty, and then you subtract the male part of it, and you add female to it, and you have an entity queen. You have the word vector, which is closest to queen. And this is remarkable, because this is a way where numbers or vectors were encoding semantic information about words. And you have more similar things. For example, they did if France is to Paris, and then they said, and then Japan is to, and you'd actually have Tokyo as the result, which is, again, absolutely remarkable. So the way we can use machine learning, again, this is a machine learning process. It's shallow learning, which is the opposite of deep learning. Um, so this was a way we could actually get incredible information about words and text using uh, machine learning, and there's a Python package, again, Jensen, which does word to ec really, really well. It's actually faster than the original Google C implementation. It was written in Python. So you can do all of these incredible things in Python in literally one line of code, and that just blows my mind every time. I'm sorry? In Hebrew too? Oh, actually, you, so in Hebrew there are, so it becomes more difficult because you would need a lot of textual data to train and build such semantic information. But technically, yes, 100%. If you have enough Hebrew text, you can definitely learn this. For example, with French and German, you have word to ec models as well. You even in English, based on the context, 
you have different kinds of models. If you train your data on Wikipedia data or on more historic, like Shakespeare data, you'll have different semantics. But technically, yes, you can use any data and any language, of course. Computational linguistics. This is another really fun part of text analysis. This is uh, when we start talking about linguistics in general, like the study of um, parts of speech, like nouns, verbs, adjectives. This is in English, of course, though I'm assuming even Hebrew or other languages you speak would have similar kind of structures. So you can understand, you can train models to understand in sentences which what, what where's the subject and the object, nouns and verbs, and you can do really interesting Really, really interesting things. For example, um, you can find if, for example, if you like Harry Potter, and then you want to find out what adjectives are used to describe, or what adjectives have been used to describe Harry throughout the seven books, you can actually, in around six or seven lines of code, using Spacey again, you can actually identify every single adjective used to describe Harry. Now, the last time I gave this example, someone in the audience said, "Can you show me the seven lines of code?" I'm like, "Damn, I should have added that." So here are the actual seven lines of code. Um, uh, so this is, this is actual code, though I haven't included, of course, all the pre-processing bits, but you have an, a list of adjectives and then four sentences in, Harry, the sentences in Harry Potter, for each word in the sentence, if Harry is in that sentence, uh, and child here, child is, again, computational linguistics. Uh, every in, when we try and make a dependency tree, we can understand what words are linked to the word Harry. And a machine learning model is trained to identify this. And then it says, if, POS stands for part of speech. So if the child of part of speech of child is an adjective, uh, is the type is an adjective, then add that adjective. And then after that, when you counter it and then you print the most common, you have the 10 most common adjectives to describe Harry. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code, which is super neat. And you can find out a lot of interesting things using Spacey. It's really easy code, it's intuitive, it reads like English. Another, another reason why I think using Python in particular make, is very, very interesting. Uh, why is it relevant uh, for Israel, or in, in general Hebrew like you asked me as well? Because of the fact that uh, the computer, of course, does not care what kind of language you're feeding it into, because in the end it's going to convert words into numbers, right? So if you have, and in fact, I Googled it a while ago as well, like I was trying to look for sentiment analysis models in Hebrew, and it does exist. There are companies in which, are, which have like APIs for you to do sentiment analysis in Hebrew as well. Uh, the, pro, the language, the library, sorry, uh, Spacey has Hebrew tokenizing. Tokenizing is the way you split up your sentences. So you actually have the potential to do really interesting stuff in any language, just not in Hebrew. As for why is it, why is it relevant? Uh, business, I mean, while this is super fun, it's also profitable. Companies like people who can analyze text, so it's definitely relevant to everybody sitting in this hall. So now, uh, I'm just going to, there's a lot of talking and a lot of information, so I wanna do a quick sum up. Uh, so I started talking about why I think text analysis is really interesting, and I gave three examples which are relevant. After that, I talked about Python and why I think Python's a good programming language in particular for text analysis. And then we talked about machine learning in text, we talked about computational linguistics, we talked about word embeddings. We talked about a lot, I showed you a few lines of code about how you can actually do computational linguistics. So we, all, we, ha we now have a lot of different interesting ways to analyze our text. And we know that text analysis itself is interesting, it gives us useful information. And that's pretty much sums up my talk. I hope that all of you really, um, Oh, whoops, I really are interested and want to do text analysis. That is the whole point of this. But of course, I've not shown you much code apart from that small snippet. So uh, this is my uh, GitHub and my Twitter and my Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I have uh, post lots of pictures of my cat. I really like my cat. Uh, but my, on my GitHub, if you go to bar, GitHub slash Bargovader slash personal, you can find many text analysis uh, Jupyter notebooks where I, I normally like to do tutorials. Uh, I really wish there was a tutorial day tomorrow. I would have loved to do a tutorial on text analysis. And I've done a few before as well. You can find them online, where I actually, every single thing I talked about in my talk, I actually have code for that easy, relatable code. So I would, if you are interested in actually doing this for yourself, I also talk about, and this is very, very important, I talk about the environment you should set up for doing text analysis because um, so I have the virtual environment, everything set up, the kinds of packages you'll need and your whole workflow, and I really walk you through it. So if you do think what I talked about right now was interesting, you can definitely check out my GitHub and my Instagram. 
but yeah, and Twitter as well. I usually tweet about, uh, well, text processing and science in general, machine learning. Um, I'm also the maintainer of a Python package called PyCobra, which does ensemble learning, a kind of machine learning. So if you're interested in machine learning in general, you can look at my GitHub again. And also, I've written a book on whatever I've talked about on natural, uh, the book is actually titled Natural Language Processing and Computational Linguistics, Text Analysis in Python. It's published by Pat Publishing House. So again, if you think my tutorials were interesting and if you think this talk uh, was personally interesting for you, uh, it would be really, you could learn a lot by, um, and my book is particularly uh, like a Pythonic approach to this. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much for having me and listening to me. Are there any questions? So uh, the question is about, uh, in general, when I talked about stop words in literature and uh, when you're working with text analysis for science or for biology or more domain specific things, are the stop words different? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, for example, when I was, I was working on a project when I was trying to again analyze newspaper articles, and in newspaper articles I noticed that the word say, said, saying came up a lot. And this is not normally considered a stop word. So I had to add this stop word to my list of stop words. Similarly, in biology, in science, or technology, or computer science, you can even analyze code itself, because even code is a language. And in all of these cases, stop words are different. And you have many, uh, you have different lists of stop words, and you can act, normally stop words end up in Python being a list, and you just add whatever words you want. There's also a lot of resources online by linguistics, by linguistic researchers who have stop words for different domains. So yes, most definitely. Okay, okay. So text analysis for good, you mean for, so, uh, for example, uh, I've, in, from, from when I think of good, for example, I'm a researcher, so for me, uh, in general, science, uh, it's, science has been largely unstructured for a lot, I mean, like, until recently, where everything is published online. So one of the first uh, text analysis projects for, there was a type of, uh, I talked about topic modeling before, where you can make topics from text. So there was a lot of work done on trying to identify collaboration patterns between researchers, where they tried to analyze different research papers and try to find underlying themes or topics and try to see how different researchers collaborate with each other and based on language and try to connect these researchers as well. Also, uh, for good would kind of be vague as well. I mean, uh, any kind of data analysis, I suppose it's the purpose of it. Uh, in most cases, I would, it's sad, but it would probably be for advertising or any kind of machine learning these days. But the same way when you could say data science for social good, for policy, public policy, if you want to understand what um, kind of policies you can, you can actually download transcripts of uh, the entire converse, uh, whatever people talk about in the British Parliament, and you can analyze it. So you can move towards open science or open uh, government, and moving towards this, you can analyze the kind of p things which politicians are talking about and better understand the kind of policies which are being talked about. So I think for social good, there's a lot of potential for text analysis. This is a really fun question. It's basically about I'm trying to see if computers can understand sarcasm in text, right? So the main problem is human beings cannot understand sarcasm all the time. So uh, when a human being cannot, sometimes it's difficult to train a machine to do this. So maybe when we get better at understanding sarcasm, human machines can too. But right now, this is actually a difficult research question. Yeah, thank you very much.